Hello and welcome to the Deathcast. I am your host, author and journalist Ian Tott, and I'd like to thank you for joining me as we prepare to open up the crypt and take another look at a true crime case. Before we get started this week, as always, I have the normal show notes. If you'd like to follow me on social media, just search for the Deathcast or Deathcast Pod. You can find me on most social media platforms under either one of those names. If you are interested in advertising on this show, please contact my agents at BigPondPodcasts.com for rates and availability. If you enjoy what I do and like to help out the show, there's a couple of ways that you can do this. First and foremost, you can go to your favorite podcast app, leave a five-star review, and subscribe. You can also go to buymeacoffee.com backslash deathcast and become a member of the Coffee Club. Lastly, you can share the show on social media. This really does help get the show out there to new listeners. Alright, now that all of that is out of the way, get yourself something to drink, find a nice comfy chair. I've got my coffee, but unfortunately I'm on the road, so I have no cigarettes. Let's go into the crypt. This week we are going back to England, specifically to the southeastern part of the country in Essex, where a listener has directed me to look into a case which is fairly infamous within Great Britain. It's known by a number of different names. The Rentendon murders, Range Rover murders, and the Essex murders. Just a few of the names that this particular case is known by. On the morning of December 7th, 1995, 47-year-old Ken Jiggins was in the process of helping his friend Peter Theobald feed the pheasants that Theobald kept in the farmland around his house. This was in the village of Rettendon. Rettendon is a village in the borough of Chelmsford in Essex. I was unable to find any demographics for the village, but it looks to have a fairly small population. The property that Theobald owned was... A fairly large farm. He had pheasants on there. He also used it as a shooting range. And on this morning, the two men were out to feed the pheasants, which normally was done twice a day. Normally, Theobald fed the pheasants by himself, but because of the snowfall, his friend Jiggins, who normally worked as a bricklayer, offered to come over that morning and help him feed the animals. According to Theobald, when he came out of the farmhouse, there was thick frost on all the windows, and it took a few minutes to scrape the frost from the windows of the vehicle they were going to be driving. Once that was done, they set off to go feed the animals. And as they drove, they noticed another vehicle sitting on one of the lanes that cut through the farm. This vehicle was a Blue Range Rover, and as they angled towards it, they found that the vehicle was sitting in front of a locked gate that fed down to a pond. According to statements later given to police, Jiggins stated that as they got nearer to the vehicle, he could see two men sitting in the front seat, and he initially suspected that they were more likely than not poachers who had fallen asleep inside of the car. As Theobald pulled up to it, Jiggins got out from the vehicle and walked up to this Range Rover, it should be noted that the windows of this Range Rover were completely clear of frost, which is an indication that it hadn't been there for very long. Especially when you consider that Theobald had had to scrape his windows just a few moments prior to the discovery. 
Jiggins stated that he tapped on the window of the vehicle to get the men's attention and almost immediately realized that the two men inside of the car were dead. And according to various sources, Theobald actually had a cell phone, which is kind of mind-blowing when you consider this is 1995. At any rate, he did have one, and Theobald, after getting out of the vehicle, he dials emergency services, and as he's describing to them the scene that he's witnessing, he notices a few things. First and foremost, that the driver's hands are still clutched onto the steering wheel. He also noticed that the driver appeared to have a gunshot wound behind his left ear. And upon further inspection of the car, Theobald noticed that there was a third individual inside who was lying down on the back seat. Theobald gave the police all of this information before hanging up and making his way back to his own vehicle where they sat and waited for police to arrive. Eventually, they did arrive, headed by Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who was kind of renowned in the area for having solved numerous homicide cases. It was fairly quickly found that there wasn't a lot in terms of forensic evidence at the scene. They had the three men in the vehicle, each of whom had been shot, the driver was sitting behind the steering wheel, and it was noted that his foot was still on the brake. Also noted was blood on the ground outside of the driver's side door. It would later be found that the three men had been shot multiple times with a 12-gauge shotgun. You can find pictures of the victims on my social media accounts. Just quickly though, I'm going to go over their injuries. All three men had been shot at least once in the head with this shotgun, with the exit wounds basically erasing most of their faces, while the man in the back seat was found to have been shot twice in the head with the shotgun and once in the abdomen. All three men were wearing jeans, which were found to be blood-soaked, while two of them were wearing leather jackets. The driver of the vehicle was wearing more along the lines of a windbreaker or a tracksuit type jacket. To see pictures of them, they almost have the air of wannabe gangsters. It was an unusual crime scene in that police were unable to tell whether or not the men had been killed from inside the vehicle, i.e. the killer or killers had been with them, or if the men had been ambushed from the outside. However, one of the first things that the police noticed was there was no shattered glass, an indication of an ambush coming from outside of the car. They reason that the victims more likely than not knew their killers or were at least comfortable with them to the point that they may have opened the doors for them or not had them locked so that they could be opened and fired upon. According to Detective Dibley, quote, This is not an ordinary murder. It looks as if they were enticed down there. As far as murders go, you don't get anything more serious than this. After securing the scene, the bodies were removed to the local morgue for identification. And I want to touch on this briefly because I've seen this on a number of different places. While the police may have suspected they knew who the victims were, the reality is the injuries suffered by the three men were such that positive identification could not be made immediately. You have to remember they'd been shot in the head with a shotgun, and this caused massive damage to their facial features. They were eventually able to ID all three of the victims as... All of them had criminal records, so when they went and took their 
fingerprints, they were able to match them to fingerprints that were on file. The three men were small-time criminals. The driver of the vehicles was 26-year-old Craig Rolfe, while the man in the passenger seat was 38-year-old Tony Tucker. While it sprawled across the back seat had been 37-year-old Pat Tate. I've read a number of different articles online stating that Tony Tucker was the leader of this particular crew, who mainly dealt in drug sales, although there is a number of sources that states the men were also involved in other criminal activity, such as loan sharking and protection rackets. Whether or not that is 100% accurate, I can't really say as I don't have access to any of these men's criminal records, but be that as it may, they were not good individuals and they had a lot of enemies, leading police to suspect that their murders may have been a gangland hit Basically, retaliation for one transgression or another. Looking at the crime scene again, police were perplexed as there were numerous areas within Retendon that were known as drop-off or point-of-sale locations. Usually, these were out-of-the-way lanes or Ponds, but this particular area where the men had been killed, known as Workhouse Lane, was fairly close to Peter Theobald's house. So the idea that this road would have been chosen for a drug deal didn't seem to make sense to the police as it would have been very easy for anyone inside of the home to spot the men out there by the road. One piece of information that is often overlooked in this case is the fact that the three men were shot a total of eight times with the killer emptying his shotgun before reloading it and opening fire again. Personally, I find that kind of interesting as given the proximity to the house, you would imagine someone would have heard the gunshots, but at least from what I've been able to discover, no one has ever stepped forward to state that they heard the gunshots taking place. Before we get looking at the actual investigation, which led to this case becoming one of the most notorious in Great Britain, let's look quickly at the victims, specifically their toxicology report. Pat Tate had only recently been released from prison roughly six weeks before his murder took place. With numerous crimes on his record ranging from drug dealing to possession and armed robbery, along with escaping from justice when he fled a jailhouse and rode away on a motorcycle, eventually ending up in Spain, although Britain was able to get him extradited back to stand trial. When they did the toxicology report on Tate, it was found he had a mixture of cocaine, heroin, cannabis, and steroids inside of his bloodstream. I've seen some commentators question this toxicology report, particularly the aspect of steroid usage. Tate was a pretty heavy handed individual and he worked out fairly religiously so the idea that he would have steroids in his system particularly at this time 1995 doesn't stand out as anything out of the ordinary for me it's known after his initial release from prison there was at least one attempt on tate's life this came in the form of someone throwing a brick through his window and then shooting him in the arm Upon being brought to the hospital, it was found that Tate actually had a stash of drugs on his person, which 
goes towards what one commentator said about him, that being Bernard O'Mahony, that Tate had a pretty substantial drug problem. Because of being found with these drugs on him at the hospital, Tate ended up getting sent back to prison. So while Tate was sitting behind bars, someone who's basically been called his best friend, Tony Tucker, took care of Tate's various business interests out in the free world. Apparently, Tate owned a used car dealership, which Tucker looked over while he was locked away. Some sources indicate that while Tucker ran this business for Tate, it was in actuality a front for his drug business, and that when Tate got out of prison, Tucker gave him the option of coming in with him, which it appears that Tate took him up on. Craig Rolfe, the driver of the car, was also known to have a pretty heavy drug problem, although I have not seen anything to indicate at this point that Rolf was actually under the influence at the time of his murder. It's suspected, however, that Rolf came under Tucker's guidance due to his drug problem. His neighbors described him as being a secretive individual who rarely interacted with them, and this secrecy did not just include Rolf, it also included his girlfriend and their seven-year-old son, although neighbors remarked that they suspected him of operating in hot cars as there were always different vehicles in the driveway. They rarely saw the same vehicle for more than a few days at a time. The leader of this group, which has been most commonly referred to as the Essex Boys, was Tony Tucker. Like Tate, Tony was a fairly large man whose main legal business was running a security outfit. Basically, he supplied bouncers to various clubs throughout the area, and it was the supplying of these bouncers that actually led to this case gaining so much notoriety in the UK. This article comes from the independent.co.uk. It's entitled, Lee Betts Link to Triple Killing. It's from Friday, December 8th, 1995, and is written by Will Bennett. Three men found shot dead in a Range Rover in a lonely F6 lane yesterday were victims of a gangland execution. Detectives are working on a link between the professional hit and a drugs ring dealing in ecstasy thought to be connected with the death of teenager Lee Betts. The three men were named as Tony Tucker, Craig Rolfe, and Patrick Tate. Tucker was a close personal friend and sometimes minded of the champion boxer Nigel Benn and had led the fighter into the ring for championship belts. All three were killed in the vicious drug gang war that broke out after police clamped down operation on ecstasy dealers in the Basildon area. The shooting is said by Essex CID sources to have been organized after dealers in the ecstasy trade were grasped by informants picked up by detectives. The three men are thought to have been muscling in on the territory of established dealers who were operated at the disco where Lee Betts bought the ecstasy tablet which led to her death. Lee Betts died last month after taking an ecstasy tablet during her 18th birthday party at a nightclub in Basilidon. Detectives investigating her death are working closely with other Essex officers on the triple murder inquiry. Last night, detectives from the Betts investigation were being briefed by colleagues from the triple murder squad. The teenager was clinically dead within hours of taking the ecstasy tablet, stamped with a distinctive apple motif, during a night out with friends at Raquel's nightclub in her hometown. 
She was taken to hospital and put on a ventilator, but never responded to treatment. After four days, her life support system was switched off. So there's a very brief overview of the Lee Betts situation. It would later be found, however, that Lee Betts had ingested 12 liters of water and had in fact died from swelling of the brain caused by this large water intake, with doctors later stating that the drugs in her system may have inhibited her ability to urinate and therefore expel the excess fluid from her body. Be that as it may, Bet's father was a retired police officer and he took a photograph of his daughter in the hospital on a ventilator and put it out to the news media in an effort to show people the dangers of illicit drugs. How is this tied into our case, you're probably wondering. Well, we already know Tony Tucker ran a hired security force business. And there's different stories and sources for this. Some state that his men worked within the club. Others that Tucker himself actually worked inside of the club as a bouncer and that while working at this club, he used his position to sell ecstasy tablets to the patrons. It is known that the Essex boys had pretty much muscled their way into the illicit ecstasy tablet trade in the area and pretty much had a stranglehold on it. So, Lee's death and the subsequent murder of these three men, it really inflamed the area because there were reports going on that our three victims were in fact selling ecstasy and mo most probably had sold bets the ecstasy that was at that point believed to have taken her life. And we will get back to this in just a moment. And we are back. Now, before the break, I was discussing how it was thought at that time that the ecstasy pills that Tucker and his cohorts were selling had led to Lee's death. There are two main theories as to why her death may have led to these three men's murders. One holds that either a local dealer or possible underworld boss realized that this was going to bring undue attention to the area's burgoing drug trade, and so he ordered these three men killed. The other theory is that a group of underworld individuals decided that they didn't want individuals who were selling tainted drugs to poison the well for them and so to send a message to other people who might do something similar they put a hit out on these three men and had them murdered so this is the kind of information that the police were initially working off of as they sought to try and figure out who had done it and why. Because the police were dealing with criminals, they found it very difficult to get any useful information. Really... The only things they had to go on were that the men had been planning to go out to dinner with their girlfriends that evening, and Tucker and Tate were still holding their cell phones in their hands when they were shot dead. Not even the men's families would talk to the police, and it was suspected at the time that the families more likely than not knew who had been responsible for the murders or at least had a good idea who had ordered them. So police did some stakeouts on the men's graves because they found that vigils were being held at these grave sites. Unfortunately, though, no useful information was able to be gleaned from this. 
One tip that came in, however, had it that the men had been responsible for the death of a 28-year-old the previous year in November of 1994. This was Kevin Whitaker. The story that was out there on the streets was that Whitaker had owed someone a drug debt. What is known is that Whitaker disappeared on November 17th of 1994 after receiving numerous phone calls from Craig Rolf. And his body was found a few days later on the side of a road. It was listed as death by misadventure. There were needle marks on Whitaker's arms and naturally the police assumed that he had died from an overdose. Police learned that during the inquest into Whitaker's death, Rolf had been called to give testimony and had denied ever knowing the man. Changing his story when he was presented with a phone bill that showed that the two men had in fact been in contact. And here's where things get a little murky. Apparently, Pat Tate's mother began making accusations against Tucker and Rolf at this point, claiming that the two men had injected ketamine into Whitaker's groin area in order to paralyze him. After which point, they injected Whitaker with lignocaine, which ultimately led to his death. Tate's mother came to believe that her son's murder was directly linked to the death of Whitaker. Whether this is true or not, unfortunately, we'll never fully know. But Marie Tate, Pat's mother, stated that it was her belief that Pat had been killed in retaliation for Whitaker's murder along with the other two men, and it was simply a case of her son being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Police have gone on the record to state that while they strongly suspect Tucker and Rolf in the killing of Whitaker, they do not believe that that young man's death is in any way tied into their own murders. Eventually, though, police were out of leads and they were forced to create a task force in an effort to generate new information, which we will talk about in just a moment. Cobra Killer, Gay Porn, Murder, and the Manhunt to Bring the Killers to Justice by Andrew E. Stoner and Peter A. Conway is the first and most detailed account of the gay porn murder that shocked a nation. Cobra Killer, featured on NBC's Snapped Killer Couples, pulls back the glitzy veil of the gay porn industry to expose a story of deceit, greed, and the ultimate betrayal. Cobra Killer, gay porn, murder, and the manhunt to bring the killers to justice, tells the story of online gay porn entrepreneur Brian Kosis, whose brutal near decapitation on a Wednesday in early 2007 sent shockwaves through the small Pennsylvania town where he ran his porn empire. The basis for the Christian Slater film King Cobra, Cobra Killer has been called an addictive page-turner that you won't want to put down by the San Diego LGBT Weekly and a grisly, gripping documentary account of the 2007 murder by Passport Magazine, Cobra Killer, Gay Porn, Murder, and the Manhunt to Bring the Killers to Justice by Andrew E. Stoner and Peter A. Conway, available on Amazon in paperback and ebook or at bookstores nationwide. We are back. When we left, we were discussing the creation of a sting operation which came to be known as Operation Century. And this was a joint effort by both the Essex Police and the RUC Special Branch, which is basically the Welch version of the FBI. 
And I want to point out that this operation actually did not lead to the arrests of the men responsible for this triple homicide. According to some documents, this operation actually got underway on February 9th, which was the same day as the 1996 Dockland bombing of Canary Wharf. This bombing was carried out by the Provisional IRA, which is the shorthand term for the Irish Republican Army, in which a truck bomb went off in South Quay, which is an area of London. Now, supposedly the provisional IRA sent warnings 90 minutes prior to the detonation of this bomb, although unfortunately they were not able to get everyone out. Two people died, more than 100 people were injured, and over 150 million pounds worth of damage was done to this area. Eventually, someone would be convicted of this crime. The reason why I bring this bombing up is the police actually used the problems that were going on in Ireland at the time in an effort to try and bully the individuals they believed to be suspects in these triple homicide into giving them the information that they wanted. Numerous reports have it that the police and the special branch communications with these suspects became increasingly profane and violent, with one individual stating that the things that the police and special branch told these suspects if anyone else had said it, would have been considered death threats. Basically, the way it worked was this. The police posed as members of the provisional IRA and made contacts with these various suspects, threatening them in the hopes of forcing the suspects to then go to the police at which point the police could offer their protection, but, you know, only if you give us information that we need to get from you. The long and short of it is Inspector Dilby was the mastermind of this, and as this operation unfolded, one of the things that was later noticed that they basically tortured these people by telling them things such as the provisional IRA was no longer just based in Ireland, but in fact had come over to mainland Britain, and that the police had lost track of them. Meaning that these individuals who were actually members of Special Brands posing as members of the provisional IRA turned drug smugglers who were basically asking these members to give them backup while also claiming to have help funded the operation of the Essex Boys. The majority of these suspects did not take these phone calls seriously, which led in turn to the escalation in the level of verbal abuse that the special branch officers were hurling at their suspects, as well as an escalation in the threats of violence that they were using, but this was to no avail. The suspects refused to meet with or have anything to do with the supposed IRA drug runners, and eventually the police had to abandon this tactic. Another lead that came into police was that Tucker, Tate, and Rolf had actually been killed because they owed an individual 60,000 pounds. Now this individual actually came forward to police from Exeter claiming to have taken over the three murdered men's former rackets. This individual was said to have been tied into the London Adams crime family 
and to also have had extensive telephone records which could be used as evidence in a case against those who had committed the murders. From what I have seen, however, this never came to anything, and that particular branch of inquiry was eventually dropped. In February of 1996, another suspect was also brought to the attention of the Essex police by one Linda Millard. Now, according to a report by the Bristol Cable, which is a local newspaper, on March 1st, 1996, 48-year-old Linda Millard went missing. Two days later, on March 3rd, friends of hers contacted the police and expressed concern over Linda's disappearance, stating that Linda had confided in them that her then-partner may have been involved in drug dealing as well as the triple homicide that had taken place back in September. The police report further goes on to account that Linda had left this particular partner after she and her partner had watched a news piece on the Essex boys' murders. And according to these friends, she was so disgusted over the revelation that her, her partner at the time may have had something to do with these murders. She just simply up and left him. However, we're really not given any details as to what it was that may have given this individual away to Linda. These friends don't state if he said something or whether she noticed a shift in his personality or mannerisms while they were watching this news program, simply that she became convinced that he had been involved with it and left him at this point. Quoting the police report, Millard believed Redacted was involved in funding drugs, counterfeiting perfume, and pornographic videos. She thought he had some knowledge involvement in the killings. She was so disgusted with Redacted, she left him. In February of 1996, Linda went to stay with friends. According to these friends, Linda's ex found her by the end of the month, and Linda went missing shortly thereafter. Linda's ex-partners said to have owned four or five homes in and around the Essex area, with each of these homes being reported as being worth roughly half a million pounds apiece. It's further stated that this man has no visible means of support or income and is known to be very flashy and routinely leaves the area to travel to other countries to sort out business. A spokesperson for the Avon and Somerset Police stated that at the time of Linda's disappearance, a 51-year-old man was interviewed and allowed the police to search his property. The police found no evidence linking this man to Linda's disappearance. To this date, Linda has never been found. Although her car was found on top of the cliffs at Battery Point Portishead, which is near Bristol. Upon searching the vehicle, police discovered that Linda's car keys, shoes, and purse had been locked inside of the trunk. It may be that she decided to commit suicide out of fear of this purported ex-partner and also could be that somebody decided to make her disappear. Unfortunately, as I stated, Linda has never been found and is case is still considered open at this point. Police also received information from a man by the name of Billy Jasper, who was a London-based gangster, that Jasper had been the driver of the real killer's getaway car. Jasper was arrested for armed robbery, and he informed the Met 
which is the Metropolitan Police Department in London, that he had been paid £5,000 to act as the getaway driver for an individual he would only refer to as Mr. D. To me, that just sounds like someone spinning a yarn in an attempt to get out of their current charges by offering up false information in the hopes that the police will believe them enough to offer them a deal, i.e. you testify on our behalf and we will make these other charges go away. Police were really searching for any leads that they possibly could. At one point, they even suspected that the murders may have been tied to a half a million pounds worth of marijuana, which had been found in a pond in West Hanningfield that they believed to have been dropped by an airplane. After the discovery of these packets of weed, Detective Dibley went on the record stating that he suspected highly that there was a link between the cannabis and the triple homicide that he was working. See, so kind of see here that the police are really grasping at straws, looking for any avenue they can to try and solve this triple homicide, which by this point as we're moving deeper into 1996, is really dominating the headlines in the UK. And in fact, it's giving the police something of a black eye. That was all going to change, however, beginning in May, when police, in conjunction with customs, arrested three men in a sting operation. This was 52-year-old Michael Steele, 33-year-old Jack Holmes, and Darren Nichols. So let's look at these three men. Michael Steele was a known drug dealer in the Essex area. From what I can find, he was mostly involved in the sale of marijuana. But he wasn't the kind of dealer who went out onto the street corners and sold his wares. He was more of a middleman. He would import it from overseas and then distribute it to dealers whom he knew. Steele did this in conjunction with his friend Jack Holmes. Police pretty quickly learned that in November of 1995, the two men had supplied Tucker, Tate, and Rolf with an order of marijuana with an estimated street value of 350,000 pounds. Now, apparently, there was a bit of a dispute between Steele and Holmes and the Essex boys as the Essex boys claimed that the weed they had been sold was of inferior quality and perhaps knowing of the reputation of Tate and company, Steele agreed to take back the unsold portion of the marijuana and also to refund them around 70,000 pounds. According to various reports, after this money was given back, Tate stated he never received it and also shorted them on the drugs that he returned to Steele and Holmes. Steele ends up going to confront Tate about this, and as the story goes, Tate humiliated him, pulling a gun on Steele and making him get down on his hands and knees and beg for his life before throwing the man out. Apparently, after this incident, Tate let it be known that he would kill Steele for having had the audacity to come back and claim that he had stolen drugs from him. And Steele heard this 
information second hand from one of Tate's ex-girlfriends who he was apparently involved in a relationship with. Now, police didn't know all of this when they arrested Steele, Holmes, and Nichols. They just thought they had three individuals who had been importing drugs. However, somewhere along the way, the police got wind of the fact that these three men may have been involved in the murder, and seeing that Nichols was most likely the weakest link in the case, they pressed him, and Nichols broke claiming to police that this is what had happened. According to Nichols, Steele and Holmes convinced Tate that they would try and make amends to him by bringing him in on a fairly lucrative cocaine deal that they had set up. Now again, this is according to Nichols. Roughly a month and a half before the murders took place, so in the summer of 1995, Steele contacted Nichols and asked if he could get his hands on a gun for him. Nichols claimed that while Holmes possessed a few guns, neither man wanted to use these. So apparently Nichols was in on this entire scheme to get rid of Tate from the get-go, which Nichols promptly did. Again, this is all according to Nichols. Steele set up a meeting with Tate for the night of December 6th at the field where he said the drugs were going to be dropped off. Nichols stated that as they saw the Range Rover approaching, Steele jumped from the car and made as if to open it. While the three men inside the Range Rover were preoccupied with watching Steele, Jack Holmes stepped up to the car with the shotgun and began shooting the men inside. Holmes, who had basically acted as a driver for the two men, had had no idea what was going to happen. In fact, he stated that he had dropped the two men off at the field and left, and moments later received a phone call from Holmes asking him to come pick them up. And it wasn't until the two men climbed into his car and he saw that they were covered in blood that he realized what in fact had happened. Nichols later told police, Steele told him, quote, They won't fuck with us again. Before describing himself as an angel of death because he had done what everyone had wanted to do but were too terrified to carry out. Nichols further stated that after this happened, he had stepped back from the game as he was fearful of what might happen, i.e., are the police going to get wind of this, or are Steel and Holmes going to grow suspicious and decide that they can keep the secret better if the third partner in this conspiracy is no longer among the living? Again, according to Nichols, after a few weeks, Steele became suspicious of him no longer being involved in things, and Nichols decided that it would be in his best interest if he kept on working with Steele and Holmes, as they might become enraged that he was no longer participating and still decide to kill him. Nichols said that the two men had insisted on him becoming more involved in their drug smuggling operations as an effort to try and bind him to them so that he could not escape and would not be able to go to the police with the information that he knew without implicating himself and exposing himself to serious repercussions, be it from other members in the gangland or from law enforcement. Eventually, Michael Steele and Jack Holmes ended up going on trial in 1997. During trial, it was learned that 
Nichols had been questioned by police for over 30 hours, and also the information concerning Operation Century came up. And it was basically found that everything involving Operation Century was illegal, and prosecutors as well as the local police who had been involved in it were chastised by the trial judge. Interesting to note that during this trial, when it came out about Nichols being questioned by police for 30 hours, it was learned that this 30 hours that he was questioned had actually not been recorded. Understandably, the defense jumped all over this particular fact as they wanted to know why the police had not recorded these conversations with Nichols. Had they been threatening him or feeding him details in order for him to sweeten his confession and make it match the information that the police had? They didn't know. Eventually, the defense locked on to the idea that Nichols had simply fabricated the entire story in an effort to get himself out of hock with the police on the smuggling charges. Now, the police had scant evidence to prove any of what Nichols stated had, had happened actually did happen. They mostly relied on mobile phone records, which back in the 1990s were extremely unreliable. On January 20th, 1998, after four and a half days of deliberation, the jury returned guilty verdicts on both men and Steele and Hume were each given three whole life tariffs. Nichols ended up going into the witness protection program after it emerged that a hit had been placed on his head with an asking price of 250,000 pounds. I highly doubt that number. If you know anything about gangland hits, for them to put a hit on somebody of that magnitude, the person or persons that they took down has to be extremely high up in the food chain. We're talking like mafia boss level to get that kind of a hit put out on them. And from all indications, neither steel or whom warranted that kind of authority or respect. So I think that the 250,000 pounds that was claimed to have been placed on Nichols' head is more likely than not an extreme exaggeration. Usually with this kind of thing, they'll put a hit out on a snitch for, you know, 10 to 15,000 not 250,000 pounds. That's absolute bullshit. If you look at Joseph D. Pastone, the FBI agent who went undercover as a mafia member for, I think it was six years, he took down pretty much every single mafia boss in the New York's five families, and that's the kind of target that was placed on his head. I can't see two guys like Steele and Hume's warranting that amount of money. Steele and Hume have both maintained their innocence since their convictions in 1998, repeatedly appealing their convictions as well as the evidence used to convict them. Most recently, a group of private investigators working for TMI have come forward claiming to have begun investigating the case in 2020. Now this group claims to have uncovered evidence which casts doubt on the convictions of these two men. Now naturally this group of private investigators have landed a three-part series with Sky News 
and they claim that they would not be doing this if they didn't have evidence that exonerated the two men responsible for the killing and i'm just stating right now i'm calling bullshit on that they're doing this because sky news offered them money to do a show on it that's why they're doing it in any event according to this group of private investigators they have evidence that links the men's murders to a almost 500,000 pound robbery that Tate had allegedly taken part in. This was the robbery of an armored car. Now these private investigators state that this man who is giving this statement was actually interviewed by Essex police shortly after the murders took place. Unfortunately, they don't really give any evidence to back that particular assertion up that Essex police actually spoke to this man about this armored car robbery and Tate's involvement in it. These private investigators further go on to state, quote, because of our backgrounds, our history, and our knowledge of organized crime, particularly in East London, we were able to get behind that. We were able to identify officers who dealt with him, criminals who knew him, and his account is compelling, unquote. Another individual that these private investigators spoke to stated that he had, in fact, organized the hit my personal opinion, and this is just my opinion, there is no statute of limitations on murder. And the idea that anybody involved in this murder, if they're working in Britain's underworld, would admit to it is highly dubious at best. Because should corroborating evidence be uncovered that can link these men to the crimes with the evidence that they give, they are therefore accessories to murder and can be tried as such. So the idea that any of these people are coming forward to these private investigators, at least to me, I'm calling BS on that one for the simple fact that if this information was true, then... Essex police can get a court order to force this private investigative firm to give up the name of this individual so that they may investigate him and press charges if what he's saying turns out to be true. No one in their right mind, unless they're being threatened or paid to say these things, is going to admit that level of complicity in a triple homicide. Especially when you take into account that these private investigators are stating that the big movers and shakers in Great Britain's organized crime underworld were involved in these murders. There is no way anyone is going to step forward and state, hey, I took part in this and here's what happened. Because it would not be very difficult for members of organized crime to find out who that individual is. Because even though it's Great Britain, there are a lot of people in their justice system who are corrupt. And just as there's a lot of people in their entertainment industry who are corrupt who would give that person's name up and they would end up being found in a field somewhere shot in the back of the head. That's simply not going to happen. Nobody is going to be stupid enough to come forward with that kind of information. And the only reason that this series has been put out is because Sky News, in conjunction with this private investigator firm, realized that they had a story that they could sell to both advertisers and to viewers to get them to watch. So, no. Nothing in that story rings of any sort of truth or believability. Alright, with that, we are at the end of this week's episode and at the end of this week's case. 
I hope you have enjoyed my look at the Retendon murders. If you enjoyed this episode or you enjoy what I do, please consider leaving a five-star review wherever it is that you get your favorite podcasts. And if there's any information that you have or you've come across that I didn't cover in this episode, please feel free to reach out to me via email at ian at corpsecreekpublishing.com. Who knows if I get enough new information on this case that I haven't covered here, I may do another episode on it. With that being said, The Death Cast is a production of Corpse Creek Publishing in association with Big Pond Podcasting. Until next time, stay morbid.